Welcome back everybody. I'm here to share my experiences with the Google Pixel Fold. Two things before we get started. If you can like and subscribe and hit that notification bell just to know when all the videos are dropping. Second thing, there are chapter markers all throughout the video. If there's something specific that you're looking for, just go to the chapter markers along the timeline or time codes in the description. But without further ado, let's jump right into the video. So just a little bit of an introduction in terms of my experiences with the Pixel Fold and my experiences with foldables in general. Uh, before the Google Pixel Fold, I've had maybe five minutes here and there with other foldables, the Galaxy Fold, the Galaxy Z Flip, but never anything extensive where I can actually create some type of an opinion or create habits with an actual foldable. I've spent the last three months kind of figuring out how a foldable, specifically the Google Pixel Fold, fits into my life and kind of the new habits I create, how I multitask, how I kind of get things done, what part of the phone I'm using the most? Am I using the outside display, the inside display? What is the ratio? Those are all the things I wanted to figure out. And in reality, would I actually ultimately love this phone or if it's something that's just gonna be you know, moving on to the next? I wanted to start off at the price and unboxing. Pricing because it kind of shocked me when they announced the actual Pixel Fold because we knew it was coming. We just didn't know how much it was going to cost. And Google has traditionally been someone that upsets markets. They upset the email market back in the day. Search market wasn't necessarily a thing really at that point. But with the Pixel line, they have basically upended the market because they put an incredible camera on an affordable phone. And so my thoughts were they were gonna bring the Pixel Fold to the market and really undercut a lot of the major players, specifically and most namely the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold and the Z Fold Flip. For the past five iterations, the Galaxy Z Fold has been the prominent, you know, highest end foldable you can get on the market today. Uh, priced at $1,799, it's been the foldable in the market. It's the foldable that everybody wants. It's the foldable that's most distinguishable. Um, and at this point, you know, if you ask someone about a foldable phone, they're going to probably talk about the Galaxy Z Fold or the Z Flip. The biggest question mark when they announced the Google Pixel Fold in May of 2023 was the price point. You know, traditionally Google has been the company that undercuts other companies, as I said. So my question was, are they going to undercut the Galaxy Z Fold severely, or are they going to price it at the Z Fold or price it over the Z Fold? You know, the kiss of death would be pricing it over the Z Fold because the Z Fold is the incumbent player in this market at this point. Foldables are very, very, you know, nascent at this point. So you're not going to see a whole bunch of Galaxy Folds out there. You will see them, but you're, you're not going to see them as often as you see, say, a Galaxy S23 Ultra or what have you. When they announced the price, $1,799 US, that priced it in line with the Galaxy Z Fold. And it was kind of, I want to say, disappointing. Not so much that Google finally announced the foldable, but more so the price. I was looking for something that was going to have that undeniable pixel UI or undeniable pixel experience um, in a foldable package that was similar to the Galaxy Z Fold, but priced, you know, at a pixel price. You know, what I was thinking was more so along the lines of $1,300 to $1,400 US, undercutting the competition, but also kind of heating it up, doing some innovative things and just kind of uh, pushing the state of the art forward. Now, what I will say is that when they did announce the price, they also included a free Google Pixel watch. Now, the Pixel watch was kind of, you know, I think the review said it all wasn't the best product, the best watch. It was a good start for Google, but it wasn't necessarily something that you want to run out and buy. But the fact that Google was just giving the watches away for free along with a Google Pixel Fold, obviously they were pro probably trying to clear inventory, but nevertheless, they included a decent watch with a Google Pixel Fold and you can have the whole you know package. You have the device and you have the watch. In spite of the pricing, it wasn't a deal breaker for me. The day of the announcement, I went and pre-ordered my Pixel Fold. I got mine on June 27th uh, and I was using it straight from that point, you know, unboxed it. The unboxing experience wasn't the greatest. I would, you know, it's not something that at $1,799, it wasn't a device that had a whole bu a bunch of bells and whistles. It was more just very basic, very in line and consistent with the rest of the rest of the Pixel line. So you had the USB-A to USB-C adapter, and then you had a USB-C to USB-C USB charging cable. Along with that, you had some of the normal uh, paperwork and things of that nature. But again, the Pixel unboxing experience was consistent with the rest of the Pixel line. There was no surprises. Immediately picking this phone up out of its retail packaging, you can feel how substantial this phone is, how premium it is. It's all metal, it's all glass. 
Um, I you know opted for the cream colored or antique colored um, finish, so it's like silver and an off-white color. But you know, in terms of its fit and feel, it feels great in the hands. Giggity, shout out to Flossie. But in general, this phone, you know, at $1,799 US feels every bit as much as that retail price, if that makes sense. It means that, you know, you don't feel like you're getting shorted in any way. You feel like you're getting your money's worth with this phone. In terms of materials, it feels quality. I believe it is stainless steel all around the phone, glass on the front, matte glass on the back. Um, I, again, I opted for the silver and off-white color. Um, but in general, when you compare it to the Galaxy Z Fold, I would say that it is in line with the Galaxy Z Fold and my limited hands-on time with that phone. It is pretty substantial, a bit more square around, along the edges, but again, it feels substantial in the hand. It has a good weight to it. Um, and just in general in design, the design of the Galaxy Z Fold is much more narrow. And you know, as a lot of people know who are into the Galaxy Z Fold, who, who have a Galaxy Z Fold, um, you know that the phone is much, much more narrow on the outside display. So in my experiences, it makes the phone a little bit harder to use. Reaching the top of the phone and especially trying to bring that notification slider down um, is kind of tougher to do with the Galaxy Z Fold. With the Google Pixel Fold, you have a much more squat outside display, but that makes it much more usable. So it feels like a normal phone. It's kind of having like a normal size phone if you want to use a comparison i would say like an iphone uh you know 15 pro at this point just a normal size phone i believe 6.1 inches this phone is 5.8 inches diagonal um, but again it's a bit more squat than a galaxy z fold making it more usable and for most people that will have this phone will probably use that outside display most of the time for most of their actual work. In terms of the hardware features, you have a speaker grill on the top along with a 5G antenna cutout, a microphone along the bottom. You have another microphone, a SIM card slot, thank God for that. It's another speaker grill, USB-C port, and two more uh, microphones, obviously for uh, noise cancellation if you're doing any type of video. It d tries its best to cancel out any other outside noises and capture the person's voice. Along the side of the phone, you have the Touch ID or fingerprint sensor on the power button, the volume up and down rocker. Along the back of the phone, you have another microphone, a flash, and then you have your three cameras that we'll get into a little bit later on. In addition to the rear cameras, you also have a selfie camera punch out on the front display and a cutout in the bezel of the inside display. In terms of the inside display, you do have your crease that is prevalent on any foldable. Um, I think most manufacturers are getting better at kind of smoothing out that crease, but inevitably the phone is a foldable, the screen is going to fold, and therefore there's going to be a crease. Now, when it comes to the hinge on any foldable, some of the earlier complaints was that the hinge mechanism was kind of limiting. It would only allow the user to fold or unfold the display at specific angles, um, and that's kind of what it allowed, specifically with the Galaxy Z Fold. And the Galaxy Z Fold, as it's progressed and iterated, it's actually gotten better. Those hinge engineers have made the hinges much more durable, much better, and it gives the user's ability to kind of fold or unfold the phone at any angle they prefer. In my experiences, one of the pleasant surprises is one, knowing and watching some of the YouTube reviews, I know that there's always been gaps for foldables in the phone. Um, a lot of the newer foldables are able to fold flat or more flat than they've been in the past, which kind of eliminates anything getting into that inside display. Lint is inevitable, unfortunately, and you know I know that hinge engineers have built ways to kind of prevent lint from getting behind the display. One of the cooler things and one of the things that um, Samsung has built into their software, especially with foldables, is the phone's ability to recognize when it's folded and make use of both, uh, both displays. Now, for me, when I was really heavy into the testing of the, uh, the Pixel Fold, what I was doing was using it in that, uh, I don't even know what to call it, I guess like a laptop mode, where I would have the phone unfolded using the bottom part of the display to balance it out while the top part was what I was watching. So if I'm watching a YouTube video, the phone's behavior is to make the bottom side of the screen the YouTube controls or video playback controls while the top side of the screen is actually displaying the video. And so it's pretty convenient, it's pretty nifty, it's smart, and you know, honestly, when you're unfolding the phone and you're watching something in that 
particular orientation, I guess the expectation is that it does that, especially knowing that the Galaxy Z Fold and the Galaxy Z Flip already do it. And in terms of my experiences with the Google Pixel Fold, the hinge mechanism, again, has been tight. It, you know, lets me kind of open and close it at any angle. And when it closes, you know, the only kind of comparison or point of comparison I have is like when you're closing a car door and you hear that thud and you're like, that sounds like a good thud from a car. Um, I don't know why people associate a good thud from a door closing on a car with quality, but that's kind of what I associate with a Google Pixel Fold. And, you know, here it is. And you don't hear any squeaking or anything like that. Um, some of the earlier foldables I knew or I've heard that over time there was squeaking developing in the hinge mechanism. So fortunately for me, there's been a many open opening and closings with this phone. I don't have any issues, knock on wood. Um, I don't have any squeaking or anything of that sort. Now, one of the greatest things about the Android OS is the fact that it's customizable and OEMs or original equipment manufacturers can take Android and make it their own. One of the biggest players obviously is Samsung where they make the whole experience, the whole Android experience is undeniably Samsung. And it's been like that for years. I think we're on Samsung's One UI version six. And at this point, it is exactly what you expect it to be. You know, there's not gonna be any surprises with any new phones. If anything, you're gonna have new features, but you know, the whole user experience is so consistent and it's what you expect. I think that's what the best thing that any manufacturer can do is give people what they expect and what they like and then add features on top, but don't change the experience just for the sake of changing the experience because then you kind of alienate people. And if there's anything that people are, are creatures of habit. So if you change things, it's gonna alienate the fans or alienate the people that like that manufacturer for what it is. The same can be said about the Pixel UI. The Pixel UI is vanilla Android. For those of you that remember, Google had what they called the Google Play edition of phones. More namely, or more specifically, the you know Samsung Galaxy series has always had or had um, Google Play editions of their phones. And what that meant was rather than having Samsung's One UI, you actually ended up having vanilla Android. And for me, that was always the version of Android I preferred. Um, and if, I, I've always said that if the Galaxy S23 Ultra or any Galaxy series phone was available as a Google Play edition, I would buy it just because I think Samsung makes great hardware. Um, I'm just not a huge fan of that one UI, but otherwise the Google Play Edition program was fantastic. It eventually evolved into the Nexus program, which it saw Google partnering with different OEMs or manufacturers to create phones. You had the Nexus phones that were coming from LG. You had Motorola kind of uh, churning out phones and things of that nature, but eventually they did away with all that and came out with their own Pixel phone. The Pixel replaced the Nexus, it replaced the Google Play edition of phones, and it was just undeniably Google. What it meant to get a Pixel was that you would be the first to get any new edition or new version of Android before anybody else, because generally if there's a new version of Android, an OEM like Samsung has to take that OS and skin it and modify it to what they want it to be. So it fits in line with their actual design ethos. For me, I started with the Pixel 2. I saw the Pixel 1, I wasn't a huge fan of that two-tone design, but the Pixel 2, that panda colorway with the orange power button was incredible. The camera was incredible. Like I just, I loved that phone and I got to a point where my iPhone camera just wasn't cutting it. I think I had the iPhone 10 at that point. The Google Pixel 2 was just incredible. Again, that camera, it was just something like you took a picture and it did what you expected it to do. It was, there was no surprises. There was no like post-processing or hoping you got a good photo. It was what it was. And what that meant for me at the time was I didn't have to take the photo, throw it into Lightroom and do some edits, which I didn't really know how to do at the time, but it made photo editing or just photo capture much, much easier and kind of made the whole process automated. You know, you took a few photos and in the Pixel 2, and specifically for me, the Pixel 2 XL, I took a photo and I would just wait for that little circle to complete the processing of that photo. And m more times than not, I was just surprised at how good those photos came out, especially when you thought that the picture was kind of, you know, ruined if someone was moving. But in the end, the photo just came out fantastic. And when my son was born, my oldest, 
I used that phone for most of his pictures just because I didn't trust the iPhone camera to do any type of a job in terms of capture. The Google Pixel uh, XL or Google Pixel 2 XL was just, I was just confident in those pictures. I think the best camera you can have is one that you are confident will take good photos, um, especially on a phone because, you know, that's kind of like a one and done thing, especially with children. You know, they're always moving around. And so if you can have some kind of confidence in knowing that you hit that shutter button, you're going to get a good picture. And I think that alone is worth the price of a phone, especially for the Google Pixel XL or the Google Pixel 2 XL. That alone was worth having those two phones along the ride. From that point, you had the Pixel 3, the 4, the 5, 6, 7, and now you have the 8 coming very, very soon. And they've just iterated. And more recently, you had the Pixel 6 and 6 Pro that had the heavy redesign with the camera bar. Um, and just kind of a rethinking of what we know a Pixel to be. Now, when it comes to OEMs and what they do with their OSs, you know, I'll keep on picking on Samsung or naming Samsung because they are the biggest Android manufacturer in the United States, at least, and probably in the world. I could be wrong on that. But either way, you know, Samsung and what they do with their One UI, how they do multitasking, or when they do, uh, for instance, they're always on display or the Galaxy S Pen, Pen, those are things that are specific to the Galaxy line and specific to Samsung's line. Google has their own set of features that they do, you know, just like every other OEM has their own version of Android, so does Google, and it's basically the vanilla Android, but with a little bit of uh, features thrown on top. One of my favorite features is the always on display, and I think that's a weird thing to say that your favorite feature of a phone other than the customizability, which is available in all Android phones, but specifically for the Pixel, the always on display is just very useful. It's simple and it gives you all the pertinent information that you need. You know, you got the weather, you got the time, you got the date, you got your battery percentage. And then if you're in a cafe or in a restaurant, don't know what music is playing, it's gonna tell you what's playing on the actual display itself or the always on display. And then if you really like the song, you can add it to your playlist just by deciding that in the notification screen. On the flip side, you have iOS and the more recent Pro phones, the 14 and the 15 Pro, that have implemented always on displays. And I just don't think they did it quite right. Um, the pertinent information isn't quite there. Uh, battery percentage, you have to tap the phone, wake the screen, get the display or get the battery percentage from there. Um, in terms of any little features like music identification, it's not there. Uh, you can see the weather even when the, with the always on display on, but you can't really see anything else. And I know I get the privacy aspect of it, but there's certain things that I don't care if my activity rings are you know displayed or the weather or things of that nature or the battery percentage. I don't know why you would want to hide the battery percentage, but that's hidden you know behind the always on display. So I think the whole point of an always on display is to give you the most important information without having to open your phone or unlock your phone, which creates distractions. Another feature specific to the Pixel line is the call screening ability. So years ago, Google announced the ability to screen your calls and it gives you the entire call transcript while the call is actually happening. So it's doing just a live transcription of whatever the person on the other side of that line and more times than not, it's gonna be a spam caller, but at least you can screen those calls and figure out who it is, but you know, you get that live transcription and you can decide right then and there if you're gonna answer the call or just send them to voicemail and just be done with it. Another feature specific to the Pixel line is the ability to uh, have Pixel or Google Assistant wait on hold for you. So, you know, generally you make a call and you call a big company, you have to hit one for this and two for that to get through the prompts where with the Google Assistant, it can actually wait on hold for you and actually give you those prompts um, on the display. So you don't actually have to hold the phone to your ear, wait on hold, or put your headphones in while you're actually going through these prompts. So it takes the monotony out of having to do all these prompts and just do it while the phone is just laying on the table. Now, another feature that is actually specific to the Pixel Fold is the ability to do side-by-side -side app multitasking. Now, multitasking in the Pixel line has always been there, but the one thing that the Pixel Fold does because it has a seven inch display is you're able to actually use apps that are in your library or on your dock and multitask them side by side. And a cool feature is if you swipe to go home like you would normally do on a Google Pixel or any, any other Android phone is if you multitask, you swipe up and you bring up all your active apps, it would actually bring back that active uh, app combination. For me, 
when I was moving with, you know, my family and I, we were moving a couple months ago. I had one side for, you know, Best Buy, for instance, and the other side for my Google Keep to take notes on reviews I was reading. So if there was things I wanted or kind of tasks I wanted to complete, but I was watching videos or reading reviews on the other side, I would use that other side for notes and things of that nature. So again, it's um, it makes life a little bit more productive and you feel a little bit better knowing that you have basically a tablet in the form of a phone. Powering that incredible Google Pixel UI is the Tensor G2, and as the G2 implies, it's the second generation of the Google-created Tensor processor. In my experiences, I never had any issues in terms of lag or apps crashing or anything of that nature, and I was using all kinds of apps for all kinds of things, uh, banking apps and what have you, to do what I needed to do. The one thing I didn't really do on this and I don't really do on any of my phones is gaming. If I'm going to do any gaming, I generally will play on a console, um, and that's pretty much it. So basically the phone was more than sufficient for what I needed it for. In terms of gaming, I would have to assume that the Tensor G2 processor would be more than up for the task. Now, the whole point of having a foldable is being able to kind of carry a phone while also carrying a tablet. So on the outside, you have a 5.0-inch display. Um, that is very bright, very vibrant, and it's 120 hertz, so it's just very fluid, very smooth, and paired with that Tensor G2 processor, it is very, very buttery in terms of just how fluid that OS is. The inside display is a seven inch screen, again, 120 hertz, fairly bright. You know, in my experiences, I will say that the phone didn't get quite as bright as I needed it to. And there's a lot of times where because of that protective coating it has, has kind of like a laminate that a lot of foldables have to protect the display. I was running into reflection issues and a lot of problems in terms of visibility. So under direct sunlight, it doesn't necessarily have the best display. So you may want to reconsider or consider where you are using your phone and how you're using a phone. If you're using it unfolded, you're going to have issues, you know, watching videos or reading books or what have you on the inside display in the outside. Now, in terms of how I use the phone, I found myself again, you know, coming from a normal candy bar style phone and developing new habits. With my Google Pixel Fold, I found myself using the phone in a folded position, meaning I was using the outside display probably about 85% of the time. So I had a 85-15 ratio where the outside display I used for most tasks. And it's not a knock on the inside display, it's more so a benefit or kind of a just a boon for the outside display, just how good it is and how usable it is. It's the perfect size. It is virtually the same size as any other regular size phone today. And then the inside display, I used it again for multitasking and productivity but also to watch videos and things of that nature or watch movies. You know, if I have, you know, I put my Pixel, Pixel Buds Pro in, I would just pop those in and watch a movie. I ended up watching um, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 on this, and it was just an incredible experience, especially with the spatial audio that's on the Pixel Buds Pro. But again, that outside display is vibrant. It's bright, 120 hertz, colorful, and usable. I think that's the biggest thing, it's usable. 5.8 inches is virtually the same size as any other, I would consider it normal sized phones on the market today. The inside display is like having a tablet. It, it's seven inches, it is bright, it's vibrant, not bright enough to watch videos or read comfortably outside. You're gonna have some issues with reflections. Again, that laminate that protects the display is there, but either way, you know, if you want to watch movies and things like that, it's more than sufficient. And then you, again, pair it with a pair of Pixel Buds Pro. You got a great, you know, theater kind of in your hands. Now, we've covered an incredible processor. We've covered two incredible displays, um, a lot of connectivity, an incredible UI. What powers all of that is a battery. Now, the Pixel line has never been known for its battery life, uh, with the exception of the Pixel 5. That phone was the undisputed battery champ. It was a small form factor phone with an incredibly huge battery um, and I believe a 90 hertz display. Um, but it also was just, it was a good, decent display. Lasted days on one charge. The Pixel 7 and 7 Pro, we have a 5,000 milliamp hour battery. And in my experiences with my Pixel 7 Pro, 
it lasted me comfortably to the end of the day. So if I took it off the charger at, let's say, 6.30, by the end of the day, my end of the day is about 9 o'clock, 9.30, I would have about 20, 15 to 20% left, um, which is decent. It's not the greatest, but it's decent. And at 5,000 milliamp hours, it's a decent sized battery. But again, you know, it's uh, it seems to be a, a bit of a power hungry po processor that Tensor G2. When the Pixel Fold was announced, they announced the battery size, and it was a little bit scary because it ended up being a 4,821 milliamp hour battery. And for me, again, you're powering a bright 5.8 inch, 5 .8 inch display on the outside, a 7 inch display on the inside and you have incredible cameras and all that fun stuff. And um, the battery kind of let me down in that respect. And so what I've come to the realization of is that it's not necessarily a deal breaker. It's just one of those things where you kind of modify your behaviors, your charging behaviors really, your charging patterns to kind of fit the phone. And you know, users or people are gonna, you know, consumers, I think a logical person says, well, I shouldn't have to modify the way I do things in order to fit the phone's behaviors. But if you want something as kind of useful and productive as a foldable, you kind of do have to make some trade-offs and the way you do things. So for my trade-off is I would take my phone off the charger in the morning, fully charge 100%, but I actually would just connect it to my USB-C port in my car. My car ride generally is an hour to an hour and a half, unfortunately. So I get to top it off during that whole car ride. Is that ideal? No, but it's what helped me get to the end of the day on one charge. And in my experiences, I was averaging about two and a half to three hours of screen on time, which isn't a whole lot, um, but it's what kind of was, you know, my use cases. And I think I kind of modified my use cases or my uses based on how long the battery was gonna last. And, you know, unfortunately, like I said, the battery just didn't last. and. I'm someone who generally will turn off 5G just because it zaps the battery pretty well, but on Verizon, they don't give you that ability, and it, it stinks because I think that would prolong the life of the phone, but unfortunately, with 5G on 100% of the time, and then a smaller battery on top of that, and again, you can't knock the phone for the smaller battery, it's just physics at this point. Um, with the Tensor processor probably getting more and more efficient with every new generation of pixels, you know, the assumption is the battery life will get better on the foldables of the future. Um, and then when battery chemistry changes a little bit, you can probably fit a little bit more battery or get a little bit more use out of those batteries as uh, time goes on. Now, the biggest thing that the Pixel line has been known for is its camera magic. You know, I would say, and I said it earlier, when I got my Pixel 2 XL, I used that camera and I had confidence that that thing was going to capture great photos every time I, you know, snapped the shutter. And that was true 99% of the time. I took a picture and I was just really excited to see what that camera was able to turn out in terms of a photo or the results. And so I think you've had a camera that's gone through some growing pains on the Pixel 6 Pro and 6. You had the camera bar that was introduced with a whole redesign of the Pixel line. And so what that meant was you have just a different way of processing photos. I believe it was a 48 megapixel photo or a 48 megapixel camera that was put in there. Um, and with that, you know, it's just more so growing pains and figuring out how the, you know, the post-processing is going to work with the new image, uh, image processor and all that fun stuff. So what I experienced in my uh, Pixel 6 Pro was a lot of issues in terms of the environment. So if I captured a picture... Um, and I'll show some examples while we talk, but when I would take photos, if there was any hint of any color in the scene, it just blew out the photo with those colors. And I don't know why I did it. I took lots of photos with that Pixel 6 Pro and it was just, you know, I lost that confidence in having a good camera. The Pixel 2 XL was something where if I hit the shutter button, I knew I was gonna get a good picture. I can confidently say at this point that the Pixel Fold kind of feels like a return to form. I don't know if they tweaked the image stack and kind of like, you know, when you take a photo, they change the way the phone processes it. It's the same Tensor G2 processor. I believe it's the same camera, but it just does a way better job of capturing photos. Um, and again, we're going to be showing some examples of the photos I've taken, but the camera has done a, a particularly good job of not 
accentuating or over accentuating some of the colors in the scene and just kind of giving you the photos as presented or as you see when you're taking the photo. Videos, on the other hand, are still not great. Um, I, don't, I don't think any Android phone is really known for its video capture capability. It's getting better. You have Samsung kind of paving the way with 8K video and things like that. The Google camera experience hasn't necessarily been something that's kind of tied or correlated to great video capture. I know that they've really tried hard with the Google uh, uh, Google Pixel 6 Pro to really improve the f uh, video capture and the way that video kind of gets processed on the Pixel. Um, I did see the improvements, you know, shooting 4K, 30 frames per second. It looked good, but then you look at something like the Undisputed Video Champ, which is the iPhone, and the videos were just much, much better. But again, Google is making leaps and bounds in terms of improving the video capture capability with the Pixel line. Um, it is improving, it just quite isn't where the iPhone line is at this point. My final thoughts on the phone is, you know, it's one of those things where it's hard to kind of recommend someone spend $1,799 US on a phone. But if you're in the market for a foldable, you cannot go wrong with the Google Pixel Fold. It is an incredibly good phone, in spite of the fact that the battery isn't quite what I hoped it would be. But all of its features and all of its benefits, everything that it does well, far outweighs the battery shortcomings. And it's okay. My, my recommendation earlier was to just modify your charging behaviors. If you're charging in the morning, if you have a longer ride, whether you're taking public transportation or you drive in or you carpool, bring a battery bank or just bring a USB-C cable and just charge while you're on your ride because what else are you going to do? You're kind of stuck where you are for the duration of the travel. So I would recommend if you're in the market for a foldable, you have options in the US at least, the Pixel Fold, Galaxy Z Fold, and the Galaxy Z Flip. Again, I'm biased because I've been using the Pixel Fold for the last three months, and I've been using a Pixel phone for the last, I don't know, seven years, eight years, however long it's been, I tend to you know gravitate toward the Pixel line because it kind of brings me closer to that uh, idea of a Galaxy series Google Play Edition phone that I know I'm never gonna see again. You know, there's a day where I get a Google Play Edition of a Galaxy S23, S24 Ultra, I'm all on board because I think Samsung does a great job in terms of design materials that they use and just the colorways. The Phantom Black Galaxy S23 Ultra is a beautiful phone that I wish had, you know, just vanilla Android in there. But until that time comes, which I doubt ever will, um, the Pixel line is what I'm gonna stick with. And if you're looking for a foldable, um, the Pixel Fold will more than suffice for what you're looking for. Gives you all the benefits and features of a foldable while also maintaining that Google UI or the Pixel UI. Plus, you get an extremely usable phone. Again, in my experiences, when you're going with a foldable, you have to make some compromises. Generally, with the display, tall and narrow just makes it a little bit less usable. And you're more times than not going to use the inside display, where I think the inside display should be just an extension, a literal extension of the outside display. The outside display should be pro you know, productivity based, using it for text messages or watching short videos or what have you, but the inside display should literally be just an extension of the outside display. It shouldn't be the main point of interaction. And I think if you make the inside display the main point of interaction, it becomes more cumbersome to use and less likely that I'm gonna to wanna to use the phone because it's gonna to be too cumbersome to open up that phone. Is it hard to open up the phone? No. But in most circumstances, I want to use the outside display and then use the inside display when I want to watch movies or for entertainment, when I want to consume things, which is what I use my iPad for. But I can replace it with a foldable, a two-in-one device, a phone on the outside, a tablet on the inside, best of both worlds, and it fits in your pocket. What's better than that? That's going to do it. It's been a little bit of a long video, and I apologize. I wanted to get all my thoughts. It's been three months. I love this phone. I didn't think I was going to love it. The intent was to, you know, buy it, try it out, and send it back because it costs a lot of money. But then I was convinced that this is the phone. I traded in my Google uh, Pixel 7 Pro, and I have not regretted that decision 
not one day. And so I love this phone. I am so excited to see what Google does with the Pixel Fold 2 whenever that comes out. But in the meantime, if there's anything I missed or anything you want to know about the phone, leave a comment. If you liked this video, like it. If you didn't like it, dislike it. But if you really, really liked it, hit that subscribe button. Thank you all for watching and you have a good day.